Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas Brosi, and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Welcome to the ISHLT Cardiothoracic Surgery Professional Community Webinar. The 10 ISHLT professional communities are the gathering place for the professional specialties that make up the care teams for our patients. Each ISHLT professional community is represented on the four ISHLT interdisciplinary steering committees, Advanced Heart Failure and Transplantation, Advanced Lung Failure and Transplantation, Mechanical Circulatory Support, and Pulmonary Vascular Disease. The ISHLT professional community webinars are free and open to all with an interest. If you are not a member of ISHLT, please consider joining this unique international interdisciplinary society. If you are already a member, thank you for making this organization what it is. If you would like to join or get more involved in ISHLT, you can contact anyone at ISHLT headquarters through the website. We hope to see you at the ISHLT annual meeting in Denver, April 19th through the 22nd. Our webinar today will discuss bridging patients to heart transplant on temporary mechanical circulatory support with the participation of five distinguished panelists from around the globe. We have a busy agenda with five speakers, so I would encourage the audience to post their questions in the chat box and we'll have 10 minutes for discussion at the end of the webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Joseph Steli, Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah. Chief of Advanced Heart Failure Section and Medical Director of the Heart Transplant Program at the University of Utah Health Center in Salt Lake City. Dr. Silik will be discussing current landscape of heart transplant under 2018 UNOS heart allocation. Nico, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, I will take it off with my task of uh, talk about allocation. Here are my disclosures. And uh, this is an international meeting, of course, and allocation around the world uh, varies quite a bit. And it ranges from uh, situations where we have one transplant program in a country and every offer uh, comes to this program to one country and two or three transplant programs and allocation simplified to alternate between the programs to one country and many transplant programs, uh, such as the United States or several countries, many transplant programs, such as Eurotransplant, Scandia Transplant and others. Now, regardless of exactly what the allocation algorithm, how it's set up, the goal I think is the same, and that is to achieve a fair and equitable access to transplantation to patients on the waiting list. How is this done? This is a balance of, uh, of the risk of mortality on the waiting list and predicted survival after transplant, and the product of these two uh, will be the transplant benefit for the patient. And, and often implementation of geographic sharing, such that patients in different parts of the allocation region uh, who are sick have a similar uh, likelihood of receiving a transplantation. Now, uh, other solid organs have allocation scores. Liver has melt score, lung transplant has lung allocation score in the United States. We do not have a heart allocation score, at least not yet. We have listing urgency in most allocation algorithms. So why don't we have a heart allocation score? And I think the main reason at this point is that as opposed to the other uh, terminal organ failures, in heart failure, we have non-transplant treatments, more than one treatment, that can change prognosis of the patient, prognosis on the waiting list. And for similar patients, different treatments can be chosen based on the clinical scenario. And that makes an allocation score uh, quite challenging. It has actually been the evolution of the non-transplant treatments for heart failure that pushed for changes in the allocation in the United States from a two-tier allocation algorithm in 1988 to six-tier allocation algorithm most recently in 2018. Uh, now, why I will talk briefly about how did we change the last allocation? What were the goals? Well, in the three-tier allocation in 2005, we had many patients in the 1A status that had different, different risk of mortality on the waiting list. This was best illustrated by the evolution of durable uh, LVADs, uh, such that in the 1A status, patients on a durable LVAD versus other patients on the 1A uh, urgency status at very different risk of urgency. 
There was also a fair amount of subjectivity about patients on IV inotropes, whether they should require ongoing hemodynamic monitoring or not. And finally, in the status two, there were many uh, other patients at different risk of mortality on the waiting list. So, so how does our allocation look post-2018? We have inpatient uh, urgency status one and two, the top two, which are basically temporary devices uh, in patients with cardiogenic shock awaiting, um, awaiting heart transplantation. We have uh, status um, we have uh, status three. Uh, again, as you can see, that's taken up by uh, mechanical security support devices in different clinical scenarios. And then, then we move to status four, stable patients on durable LVADs, and, and then some groups that were maybe underrepresented or, or a little bit lower than they should have been on, on the previous system, uh, allocation system, retransplantation, restrictive cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease. Multi-organ can, transplant candidates are status five and all other candidates status six. So with that, we've now had four years to evaluate this uh, most recent iteration of our allocation algorithm. What were the key intended results and were they achieved? Well, the key intended results were broader geographic sharing, and that was achieved. Reduced mortality on the waiting list, and I think uh, we have shown that that has happened. And uh, maintain favorable post-transplant survival, despite maybe increasing allograph ischemic time or taking uh, some patients who are at a higher risk uh, at the time of transplant. And I think overall, those three main goals of the uh, allocation change have been achieved. Now, uh, partly why the decrease of, of uh, the decrease of mortality of the waiting list was achieved was that we have better risk stratification on the waiting list. But next, I would like to just pinpoint a few things that maybe still need some tweaks or where uh, we have some reason for concern. In status two patients, we do see that we still have a relatively wide range of risk of mortality on the waiting list. And, and this study looks uh, as a reference for patients waiting with intraortic balloon pump. And we can see that in status two, patients with uh, surgically implanted devices, non-dischargeable devices, and uh, patients in VT storm have higher mortality risk than those on balloon pump. What we've also seen is increase in status exceptions. And that is a situation where a clinician feels the patient should be assigned to a certain status, but they don't, don't fully meet uh, the certain criteria and, and exception status uh, requests uh, did go up. One of the big reasons for holding the seminar today, uh, talking about temporary mechanical circuitry support is that probably the most dramatic change that happened in 2018 after the change of allocation was a rapid increase in the use of temporary circuitry support as a bridge to transplantation. And I think this slide is pretty self-explanatory as far as uh, what these uh, changes uh, brought. Another maybe a little bit less talked about uh, effect of the allocation change is that the likelihood of weaning of temporary mechanical circuitry support devices before transplant has decreased. So meanwhile, in, in the previous allocation system, patients were on ECMO or, or Impella or balloon pump and waiting for transplantation. Some of these patients with adjustment of medical therapies uh, actually saw recovery of myocardial function to the point where temporary support could be uh, withdrawn and patients were tried on guideline-directed medical therapy. Uh, in, in this study, the investigators have shown us that actually there has been decrease in the likelihood of this happening under the current allocation system. And finally, we have seen reduction of durable LVAD uses bridge to transplant such that more than 80% of patients receiving durable LVADs today are receiving them with the intent of permanent therapy. And the overall number of durable LVAD in the United States as a result has actually dropped. What is the future of allocation system? And I think the aspirational future is to have continuous distribution. Uh, and this is an example of such, and that is a distribution where the intended donor and the recipient factors are considered, and there are many more than in our current allocation system as far as data points. And uh, the result is not several urgency statuses, but uh, really a continuous score. And when an example, uh, when a match is run, this is an example, the patients will come up based on achieved number of points. And in fact, uh, 
lung transplantation is moving in the direction of a continuous distribution score in the United States imminently. Before that happens in heart transplantation, I think we will be seeing a lot of temporary circulatory support before transplant. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what my uh, co-panelists have to say, and I will pass the podium to the next speaker. Dr. Brosi, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Dr. Stelic. This was a great presentation to set up the stage for the following speaker, Dr. David Barron, Professor of Medicine at Eastern Virginia Medical School, Section Head of Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant and Mechanical Circulatory Support Program at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, in Western Florida. Dr. Barron will be discussing intraortic balloon pump and inotropes versus impella, selection criteria, and implanting strategies. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brosi and others. It's, it's a privilege to work with you and the team here at Cleveland Weston. And we'll talk today about uh, uh, the uh, balloon linotropes versus impella and so forth. Disclosures are here, they're not particularly relevant. So we'll talk in this eight minutes or so about which patient for which device, a topic that you could probably spend an hour on. We'll talk a little bit about some aspects of implantation of balloon in patients and implantation of the impella family and some conclusions and broad brush strokes. But we'll start where I think every clinical talk should start was with a case. And this is a case that we had about two months ago. A 53-year-old woman came in right before New Year's Day to outside hospital, no prior medical history. She noted that she developed the insidious onset of symptoms that the physicians attributed to heart failure. She didn't know it was heart failure, but clear to anybody who's in heart failure that that's what was going on. And she was treated, of course, as oftentimes happens in the outside emergency room for pneumonia. And uh, when the patient didn't get better, she went back to the emergency room. Now with worsening disamount exertion, now she had edema, and uh, they then made the diagnosis. They admitted her actually to the ICU in what we'll affectionately call St. Elsewhere, uh, and recognized that she was fairly sick. She was hypotensive. Uh, she was sky B. They did a cath which showed no significant obstructive disease uh, and noted on LV gram that the EF was 10%. Uh, in addition, they had a CTP protocol and she actually had multi-segmental pulmonary emboli and was given heparin. Um, she did not have a swan at that uh, time. She just had a triple lumen that was inserted in the ICU. But eventually when urine output remained very poor, um, they noted that she had a SAF from the triple lumen of 44% and eventually added inotropes. And as oftentimes happens, uh, centers are somewhat reluctant to call for help. So they failed to wean from inotropes three separate times. Each time they would wean, the patient would stop making urine and feel unwell. And finally, they decided to give her a center a buzz. But the data is summarized here. Uh, value of the ECG is that this is the left bundle. The, the x-ray is down there, and you can see that such a pattern suggests this is probably not acute. While the patient just acutely had symptoms, a bundle branch block in the absence of ischemia is unlikely to have developed overnight. And this was her initial calf uh, where we had her on milrinone, uh, Bumex drip at a milligram an hour, and uh, you could see PA pressures in the mid-40s with a cardiac index by thick method of 1.5 and by thermal dilution 1.06. And mixed venous, even on melanoma 0.25, not much better than it was from the triple lumen in the other hospital. So the choice of devices, and really as I try to conceptualize this, the really the debate that everybody has is, well, do you start slow and slowly increase, or do you start super quick and then come back down? And when I was thinking about it, Google suggested that this really was the story of the tortoise and the hare. And so if you allow me to have the picture at the right, with the rabbit saying, you'll never make it, I'm too fast, come on, hurry. And the, the, uh, the rabbit would represent the sort of start big, very intense circulatory support versus the, uh, the slower approach. Uh, and this issue is what we should do. So I'll put up this poll. What temporary device would you guys recommend in uh, cyberspace for this patient? Clearly failing inotropes, a sky C based on hyperperfusion, 
and we have Juliet put it up. All right. Well, so Ashley, interesting results. 55% would go right to a surgical 5.5, five, followed by 21% with the balloon pump, 14% with Impella CP, and a few people would 10% would choose VA ECMO. All right. So the majority would just go to an Impella 5 family. Okay. Let's see what happened. Well, this happened. Of course, we do an echo. And this was one of these moments where the echo tech calls you to come into the room. Sure, the heart doesn't move, but we're pretty used to that at our heart failure center and the RV looks adequate, but she's got a gigantic thrombus just, you know, sort of waving its uh, fist at us. Uh, and that certainly changed things a lot. This big, ugly, gelatinous clot in a lady who had already had pulmonary emboli at the other hospital. Oh no. So what do you do to cope when things go wrong? I mean, I think one of the things that works well in shock teams is that you adapt on the fly. And we had thought about the possibility of maybe a CP, maybe a five, maybe something else. Remember, most of these patients present, and while you have your eyeball test, you don't have a transplant workup in most of these patients. Uh, you don't actually know what the destination is going to be. Uh, and in this case, with the finding of a very large uh, mobile thrombus, it at least makes it less attractive, if not very unadvisable, to put an intra-arterial device into the left ventricle. So we went to plan B, um, and we placed a, a balloon pump, and we weren't at all certain that it was going to be enough. The index granted by FIC of method of that one. So we put a femoral balloon pump, but because the patient actually was a super responder, she did really, really well. She uh, augmented her blood pressure by about 40 points. Mixed venous came up very, very steadily. The next day, my partners transition over to an axillary implant of an A-French balloon pump and uh, obviously anticoagulated. Uh, ended up waiting about two weeks in this case uh, for a transplant. One of the happy circumstances of the new allocation is it allows patients who truly don't have another option uh, to get transplanted more quickly. But how do you decide in general? So that's one case you already know the answer we all face these cases all the time and there's no trial data nor is there likely to be trial data and I like this picture because it points out that you have to use the right tool and while the hammer is quite good for nails it's really not so good for screws and so some practical advice that I would give I think it's really important when you're dealing with the individual patient at your bedside to try and estimate what is the trajectory and the trajectory means how quickly are things changing? Is the patient falling apart in front of you? Are the vitals so unstable? So if it's a slow trajectory, maybe you think, well, we have some time. The patient's not literally coming apart at the seams. Um, you might consider a lower intensity, lower cost device with a plan to escalate. Uh, and in this lady, she was quite ill. And I would think that we would have considered a higher intensity device had an option for the thrombus. But it's important that if the proverbial car is going off the cliff, I would recommend the one bullet approach. And mostly that reprofiling is critical. These kind of patients evolve over hours, uh, these going off the cliff patients, not in days or week. And lastly, that nighttime is oftentimes the most dangerous time in the hospital, second only to perhaps go in a CAT scan for bad things happening. Uh, and this shows you two cars that went off the cliff. And the interesting thing, the one on the left, you may be familiar with the case of the Tesla in California that drove off uh, on purpose uh, as an attempted uh, murder-suicide. Well, fortunately, the car was well made and so the people were able to actually survive and uh, say what actually happened. Less likely for this person who unfortunately drove their car into the water. The analogy to patients is very clear. If you're dealing with a patient that's literally evolving in front of you, really, really ill, you may not have time for a second device. You may have to choose the first device very wisely. And so the one bullet approach, the patients who are sky D or definitely sky E, choose your best option that you have available. Choose maximum flow if you can, but with an acceptable safety margin. It's not as simple as, oh, sky D or E, just use ECLS, for example, because maybe the patient has difficulties with vascular access or whatnot. So always things have to be tempered by what's safe and also what's available. 
if in fact getting ECMO, for example, in your institution may take six hours and your judgment is the trajectory is such that you have 20 minutes, well, then you may have to choose what you can get quickly. Consider where you're going. On the other hand, if you have a slow smoldering burn, you might be able to get by first with inotropes, a swan. Remember that the physiology of balloon pump in dilated cardiomyopathies and non-ischemic situations is different. And so some patients are super responders and serial observation with the swan is really paramount. I know there's lots of non-invasive devices with clever names like cheetah and whatever else, but honestly, swan and Gans's creation of the 60s, I think is still the cheapest and best. Um, it's possible as well to switch from balloon pump back to a sheep over a wire very easily. And so for your patients who are typically sky B or C, you can consider a lot of different options. If you're implanting a balloon, consider the time frame. Theoretically, you can ambulate with femoral. Some of my colleagues in Connecticut and elsewhere will ambulate femoral balloon pumps, but it's a lot kinder on your patient to do it from an axillary approach. Most of us do percutaneous. There are some centers that will put a graft in for a French device, but issues are abound, including migration of the devices, rupture, injury of the brachial plexus, and most of the biggest risk under support that the patient is on a device but they're not fully supported and optimized part of the transplant. On the other hand, the impella doesn't really suffer as much from under support, although it can. CP typically is a femoral device. There's very little experience with CP via percutaneous axillary approach. Can be done, but uh, problematic based on the size. And most of us are now moving to impella 5, and I call it 5X, because whether you have the original impella 5 or the newer 5.5, 5, you still have the following problems. You have to have a commitment to support the patient. So if the patient, for example, the uncertain neuro status, putting on an impella, which is an expensive device, involves the OR, um, it may not be necessarily the best idea if you're not sure if you're going to be able to support the patient more long term. Surgical skill matters is probably not a device that can be placed once a year. Where I see the uh, skill of my colleague, Dr. Brosey, placing one of these, or Dr. Sheffield. It's amazing. It's a very, very straightforward procedure, uh, like an ICD, actually, in other people's hands. It's so simple, uh, and uh, not every center is able to do that. Uh, you need a viable exit strategy, as we've said, but you also need time in an operating room. This is not a bedside procedure. So if you have patients you know, that need something bedside, Impella may not be an option, despite its better support. And if the issues include bleeding, hemolysis, less so in the larger devices, migration still occurs, and under support, particularly biventricular failure. While the Impella 5X family will certainly provide four to five liters of support, you can't get blood from a stone. And if you have biventricular severe dysfunction, this will be unmasked quite quickly when you find that you can't flow on the Impella because the right side is out. In conclusion, there is no solid evidence to guide choices, and yet we all deal with the same problems every day, every center, every country. You have to rely somewhat on your institutional experience I would advise to match the degree of initial support to the perceived trajectory. The critical, critical importance of reprofiling uh, and remembering to keep seeing what you're doing if it's working uh, over time. And I would propose that the balloon pump is not dead. Some heart failure patients are well served with this cheap and venerable tool. Balloon, uh, Impella as well is a very valuable tool in the right patient. And approaches which facilitate ambulation are critical as waiting times increase. And all the statuses, even our new status two and one, become more and more crowded. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barron. I'm sure we'll have an interesting discussion to follow all presentations. Now, when patients are progressing in spite of lower profile devices or present more of a biventricular phenotype, consideration is given to venoarterial ECMO support. And our next speaker, Dr. Roxana Moyedifar, a cardiothoracic surgeon from University of Vienna, We'll be discussing bridging patients to heart transplant on venous arterial ECMO, indications, cannulation options, and winning strategies. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you to the community for the possibility to present this very important topic. I have no financial relationships to declare, um, so I actually also wanted to start off my presentation with a case um, of a 33-year-old female um, that underwent mechanical bantle procedure and hemiarch due to type, uh, acute type aortic dissection. We also had to perform double bypass with a vein um, to the RCA and the ALD because um, both vessels were completely dissected. 
um, initially. And um, actually the cardiac uh, function was very well after cardiopulmonary bypass was stopped, but due to respiratory failure, we had to implant the venoarterial arterial ECMO um, because of pulmonary edema of the patient. On post-operative day one, uh, the patient underwent ventricular fibrillation um, and uh, we had to do coronary angiography due to this ventricular fibrillation and saw that something was wrong with the RCA bypass. So they went, he went back to the OR and saw complete thrombosis of the bypass. And also uh, at the time, uh, at the time the biventricular function, function was horrible um, with almost no rest function. So we could resolve this problem of the bypass, but um, on post-operative two after that, um, we saw that um, still the biventricular function was horrible, but we saw that also there was a thrombus right under the mechanical valve. So we had to switch uh, the biological valve, uh, the mechanical valve to a biological ventil, and also implanted an LV vent, and um, also left the sternum open because of that. So this patient underwent in the following days multiple revisions for bleeding, and we also even had to switch the ECMO cannulation from peripheral axillary to central ECMO because of extreme bleeding of the, of the, per, of the peripheral um, cannulation site. So it is safe to say that we exhausted all the surgical options that we had there, um, and we could not see any signs of myocardial recovery in this patient, patient by ventricular. And uh, it's safe to say what, what to do now, what, what should we do in this patient? So if you, uh, so the ECMO is perfect in this case. Uh, we have, it gives us time. It gives us time for hemodynamic stabilization. It gives us time for end organ damage recovery. And it gives us time for bridge to decision. We can see is the patient a candidate for transplantation and it can await heart transplantation, my dad. As we heard earlier already, um, in the United States, this patient, when listed for transplantation and on ECMO would be status status one, meaning high urgent status would be granted to this patient right away, and it would be allowed for transplantation probably earlier than other patients. Um, also because of the allocation system, as we also heard earlier, um, ECMO bridge transplant therapy went up since 2018 by one, increased from 1.2% to about 7.6%. But it's not everywhere, like in the United States, um, like I said, it is automatically status one, but for example, in Austria, we are part of Eurotransplant, and on short-term MCS, people, patients are not automatically high urgent. Um, they have, we have to request a high urgency status and it has to be granted. In France, we have the candidate risk, they have the candidate risk score, score there, um, where ECMO also gets um, specific points for it. And in Italy, short-term MCS is a status, uh, also status one, meaning high urgent. Just to have like a little bit of an overview of how it is in the world. I also talked about um, the cannulation technique. We had to change our cannulation technique in our patient. Um, I wanted to give a short overview. I'm well aware that most of the people here, and most of our colleagues here um, know about this, but um, we have the central cannulation with the big intrathoracic vessels that are cannulated. Then we have peripheral femoral cannulation, which can be done percutaneously in saligan technique, but also in cut down technique, which has the advantage of being very fast implanted and in patients that are acutely deteriorating or um, on CPR. We also have peripheral axillary cannulation as an alternative, um, for example, in patients that experience limbic ischemia of the leg. Um, we can implant the, via the peripheral, uh, uh, via the um, uh, axillary artery. It can be also done in a direct cannulation, or you can, as we do it in our hospital uh, with cut down technique and via graft anastomosis of uh, graft uh, into side to the artery. And I also wanted to mention vena venous um, arterial ECMOs, just as a little bit of a, a step up uh, if you need some special, uh, if you need more, um, if you need uh, extra drainage and second drainage cannula to even reduce the filling pressures more. I also wanted to mention uh, something that we implanted, uh, that we started in Vienna um, some years ago. Uh, we like to um, do awake ECMO implantations. You know, the perfect patient for that, for example, would be ICU patient, um, fast deteriorating. Um, and we do that in local anesthesia, maybe on the light sedation, um, maybe on the light sedation of the patient. And, um, sorry, I uh, light sedation of the patient. And um, the positive thing about the advantage here is we have no sedation. So it means no uh, risk of right ventricular failure, right ventricular dysfunction, and risk of CPR would be minimized by that too. Also, 
because we don't use general anesthesia, there is no, there is no, there is not going to be a hypotensive phase. There's not going to be a bradycardia, and we also the risk of the intubation also um, is not given there because um, the mechanical ventilation part was way, and also because um, the risk for pneumonia would be way less because of that. So. What is also very, very important here is to say neurological evaluation of the implantation of the ECMO because the sedation falls away is also possible, which is also facilitates the whole decision process afterwards. So we have the ECMO implanted um, and we want to figure out is the patient good for transplantation, yes or no. So the Philips um, et al. compared the outcome of patients after bridge transplant. To trans bridge to transplantation and bridge to ALVAT, and actually found no significant difference in the mortality between the groups. But way, what is a little bit more important even here is they um, defined several predictors of mortality for both groups. Um, we defined, for example, especially patient age, right ventricular failure, um, creatinine, creatinine, and the etiology of the disease and the donor ischemic events that are the most important factors in guiding the appropriate uh, bridging strategy after the ECMO, from the ECMO. So we can see a patient selection is key. And another score that could facilitate patient selection is the impact score, which is a 50-point risk score, a validated score um, with a consisting of 12 preoperative variables, for example, age, bilirubin again, and dialysis, female sex, also the etiology of the disease. And um, it can predict the likelihood of post-transplant one-year mortality. So is there the perfect ECMO patient? Is there a Prince Charming of ECMO patients? And unfortunately, I have to say no. But there are some factors that can help us guide into the right direction. I would kind of call them here the red flags of our Prince Charming, um, which is older patient age. We have normal right ventricular function. Patients with normal right ventricular function could go into the direction of ALVATS. Um, renal insufficiency and liver dysfunction is really, really important factors in one of the major contributors to post-transplant mortality. Uh, we have infection which is also very important, especially thinking about post-transplant immunosuppressive therapy. We have the neurologic evaluation that is an important point, and also, as you already mentioned, the etiology of the disease. So let's go back to our case here. Um, if you look at the red flags, the patient actually checks all the boxes that we could go in the direction of transplant. We have a young age, normal BMI, no signs of infection, our red ventricular function were practically non-existent. Um, you have the neurologic evaluation. We did it uh, after reduction, reduction of the sedation, and it was also positive. Um, the renal function was good with no renal replacement therapy, and also bilirubin was good uh, in the normal range. So we actually did it. We went uh, for cardiac transplantation. We listed the patient, requested um, high urgency status, were denied the first time, and then um, did their second request, and the status was granted then. And two days after um, the high urgency status got accepted, that we had uh, could uh, the patient could undergo a successful heart transplantation, was actually extubated on postoperative day three. Um, had to be reintubated, unfortunately, because of muscular um, because of muscular problems. But um, due to um, but uh, actually two months later, we could discharge the patient um, in very good condition. And this was five years ago, and she's well aware and uh, well uh, off and working full time in a very good condition. So we have the ECMO, we have the patient transplanted, but when are we gonna when are we gonna explant the ECMO? Is there is there the perfect timing to trans uh, to ex explant the ECMO again? And we have to say yes, there is the, at the time of transplantation. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, respiratorily stable, we should explant the uh, ECMO at the time of transplantation. So we do it at our, our hospital too. Uh, but of course, there are different factors that are um, important in important reasons for renal arterial ECMO after transplantation. First of all, PGD, of course, primary graft dysfunction, respiratory failure, of course, bleeding complications causing hemodynamic uh, instability, and also just for safety reasons. If we wanna wait for one more night or one more day and then explant the ECMO on the next day, it could be okay, but you should have keep in mind, every ECMO that is left in is a bleeding risk and also, if the heart is pumping well and there is peripheral ECMO implanted, that, that could also be very counterproductive. If the patient, if the ECMO is left in, is uh, left implanted uh, and in, so afterwards, after a few days, um, weaning off from ECMO is um, 
uh, is thought about, we can, it is a, definitely a multidisciplinary approach. It is important to check if the patient requires mechanical ventilation and why he needs mechanical ventilation. Is the patient on low dose inotropes? Uh, we have to do bedside echocardiography with the parameters for cardiac recovery that I um, put on the slide. Uh, adequate anticoagulation should be established and after that gradual reduction of the ECMO to low flow is possible. Uh, we should not go under 1.5 liters per minute. We, can't, we don't want clotting of the machine. And uh, it should be done preferably in the OR because after that, and it's you know, it's okay and okay is given for winning, we prompt the cannulation should take place. We mostly do this in cut down technique, especially in femoral, um, in femoral cannulation can cases because the bleeding can be controlled then and the thrombectomy could also be done of the vessels. So... In the end, um, in conclusion, summary to say, what are the most important factors that guarantee us uh, successful transplantation after ECMO implant? And we can say that first of all, patient selection is key. It is the most important factor here. And also second thing is fast transplantation, which is often not facilitated uh, because of the different allocation systems all around the world. Thank you, Dr. Mayedifar. This has been a thorough presentation covering all major aspects of these challenging situations. Now, how do you, uh, how do heart transplant uh, teams reach patients on temporary support when you have limited resources? I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Lorena Montes, cardiothoracic surgeon at Fundación Cardiovascular in Bucaramanga, Colombia, who will be presenting bridging patients in shock to heart transplant in Latin America. So hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, this uh, kind presentation and for the invitation to this webinar. So let's speak about the Latin American experience. I have nothing to disclose. This is our agenda for today. And let's start with a little perspective. So Latin America, for those who doesn't uh, know uh, a lot about it, is a linguistic and geographic concept to identify a large region in the Americas where Romance languages are predominantly spoken. But we are 20 countries that are 13% of the land of the world. The population is more than 650 million people. And uh, we are the 9% of the GDP of the world. If you want to compare to USA, USA is a quarter of the world. USA is a quarter of the GDP of the world. So we are very, very different and we have different health systems, uh, in public and private um, health systems, almost all our, our uh, countries. But we also have subsidized uh, uh, countries that have the government paying uh, all the expenses from health. We also have difference in our governance as in politics, we have a lot of bureaucracy. Um, and is it a shaky region? Well, we've been very dynamic for our last uh, 10 years uh, politically too. So yes, we do have a delicate stability, but we don't want to be um, behind. And in 1968, Dr. Servini at Sao Paulo started the first trans the, did the first transplant in uh, Latin America. And after that, every country one by one started doing it. And we have a lot of young countries and young programs uh, such as uh, Panama who started in 2016. And if we go to mechanical support, of course, uh, is also pretty new for us. No more than 15 years here uh, with ECMO and uh, Centrimac or others. Uh, the okay. most popularized one is the balloon, con counterpulsation balloon. And, um, we all, uh, the, all the countries that have a transplant program, cardiac transplant uh, program has uh, an ECMO, but Ecuador and Uruguay have only ECMO for support. We have a Centromac, almost all of us. Impella is very expensive for us, but Panama is implanting 14 Impellas uh, a year, and Brazil has it for some uh, expensive insurances. Burning Heart is just for pediatric in some uh, countries. And we have HARME 2 and HARME 3 in a few countries as uh, Colombia, Costa Rica, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, and uh, Chile. So the actual situation for transplant is this, if you look at the right, you can see that 
Latin America is in the part of other, and we are not even the 10% of the transplants in the world. But this also accounts because we are kind of lazy and we do not uh, register, we do not uh, send the registry correctly, but we are working and we are working hard. And right now we are 182 centers that do transplant, uh, cardiac transplants in Latin America. Of course, Mexico and, and Brazil have the most centers with 61 each. But if we go to the rate of transplants, um, Uruguay is the best with uh, the best uh, rate for transplantation per million uh, habitants. But we still very pale in colors in this map if we actually compare to US, uh, Canada, Australia, and Europe. So this is the moment of truth. These are the transplants that are done in uh, Latin America. The blue is Brazil. Uh, since uh, 2011 until 2022, the blue is Brazil, the orange is Argentina, and the gray is Colombia. So this is important, the situation that we get, because if you can see here, we have uh, an important uh, number of patients that are dying in the waiting list. And we have a large uh, number of patients that are waiting in the waiting list, that's still in the waiting list. And these patients are different than, from, um, than the patients from uh, North uh, America and from Europe, because these are patients that are not uh, getting an LVAT, a durable LVAT, and uh, waiting in, at home uh, easy for the transplant. No, these are patients that are coming every now and then to the clinic, to the heart failure clinic for inotropes or um, finishing like this. So this is why we have this situation and 60 to 70% of the patients in Latin America actually goes to transplant in situation of urgency emergency. Um, only Peru and Chile actually have 40 and 49% and they have a very well uh, ambulatory established uh, program. But when you get um, a NECMO or a short VAT uh, in Argentina, you will have 12 days of approximately of waiting for the transplant. In Colombia, it will be 30 days, in Peru, 20 days, and in Chile, 40 days until you get a transplant. So how's the situation on bridging, bridging uh, in MCS to transplant in LATAM? So of course, um, what we all have and we all use is a balloon uh, contrapulsation. In our institution, we use that axillary for uh, uh, movement of the patient and rehabilitation and reconditioning. Uh, Brazil uses a lot also uh, balloon contrapulsation, but in terms of uh, other, so Ecuador actually did 15 child transplants between 2021 and 2023. One patient was bridged in ECMO, and after um, the patient um, uh, received the ECMO, six days after that, uh, he went to transplant, and after eight months, the patient's still alive. Costa Rica had 32 heart transplants and two patients were in Centromax as rich to transplant. Both survived, but the problem, bleeding, of course. Um, Panama and Uruguay had known, but in Uruguay, they had three patients that were actually uh, perfect for bridge uh, to transplant in uh, MCS ECMO, but um, they had to work the legislation because they had to go to the government and ask for, for permission. And that took a long time. One of the patients actually died on that waiting uh, list. Mexico has 240 uh, heart transplants from 2015 to 2022. 13 patients were in ECMO or Centromac as bridge to transplant. And of course, the problem, they had good results, but the problems were, uh, of course, bleeding again. And uh, Peru, Peru has a very, very um, um, clear work and uh, they had 107 heart transplants between 2010 and 2022. 25 patients uh, had Centromax as bridge to transplant. Three of these patients died on NCS, two were pediatric, pediatrics, sorry, and one um, actually had a thrombosis of the circuit and he died. 22 of the other patients, 22 uh, patients were transplanted, but the rate of bleeding was pretty high as 20%. So Brazil, and let's start with literature because, um, there's a really, really, really few um, papers published from us, from Latin America, 
but well, a lot to show. So Brazil actually had this uh, paper of 49 patients that went to uh, mechanical circulatory support with Impella versus ECMO. And um, one of these patients, only one was bridge to transplant with a good outcome. Uh, in the right, we have another uh, paper published, but this one is in pediatric and congenital heart transplantation. They were also assessing the learning curve. And um, this one is uh, pretty much uh, uh, the experience to January to August uh, 2016. It was 16 patients that underwent uh, actually Centromac to go to, to transplant. And of this, 62% went to transplant with uh, a good outcome. So the conclusion of this study was that this is a good um, way to go for very sick patients, as well as in Argentina, where the Favaloro group published uh, this paper with 37 consecutive patients, 14 were in ECMO and 23 were in the Centromac. And um, these patients actually uh, went to heart transplantation, 81.1% went to heart transplantation. And uh, with this, um, they had a good outcome. And this um, conclusion of this study, that this is a life-saving approach, uh, allowing very ill patients to get to the transplant. This is from Chile. Uh, these were 28 patients that went to, uh, cent uh, all these patients were to Centromac as bridge to transplant. And all these patients were Intermax one and two, very ill patients. Um, almost half of the patient actually uh, received CPR before getting the Centromac. And from this, 20 patients uh, survived the support, 18 were transplanted and actually 16 still alive. This is the survival curve. As from Colombia, where I'm from, we have this paper from Fundación Cardio Infantil in Bogota, which was a, a series of cases of five cases as bridge to transplant, also um, having a good outcome and also supporting the use of MCS in LATAM for critically ill patients as bridge to transplant. Now, as uh, for Fundación Cardiovascular, which is the center that I um, work in, uh, we are a large center with a big volume of ECMO. We have 26 um, ECMO ICU beds for adults and we have another uh, for pediatrics. We did 144 heart transplants from 2009 to 2022. 12 patients uh, went to ECMO arterial or short bud with Centromac as bridge to transplant. And only in 2022, we did 12 transpl uh, heart transplants. Five of the patients were to cent um, went to Centromac as bridge to transplant. Four of these were transplanted. One of these uh, had a bivat. All four patients uh, survived with very good results. And uh, one of the patients actually was a bridge to transplant, but the patient had um, uh, a lot of antibodies, antibodies. So we changed uh, this patient to implant a heart rate tree, but the patient before implanting the heart rate tree, the patient uh, developed a massive stroke and died before the implant. In 2023, we've done one ECMO uh, as bridge to transplant for a retransplant with a very, very good outcome actually. And we did um, short back with Eurocet, not Centromac, uh, and this patient actually was transplanted seven days after the after the VAT implantation. This is how we uh, are managing our patients. So this is a patient that is in the Centromac, and uh, in the right, this is a patient for Ecuador. They actually look very alike, but it's different countries. This is the patient from Ecuador that I was telling. So what are the problems for us? So we are different. We have a geographically um, difficult uh, places. So we have the jungle, of course, we have also the forest and we also have a lot of mountains. So it makes it difficult for all of these people who are also Latin American, all of us, to get to the access. So we have a low rate of donors and an increasing waiting list, an educated population with difficult access um, to health system, legislation and bureaucracy all over. The health system and the payments are uh, very difficult also because uh, we have countries that actually the, um, the institution covers all, all of, the, um, of the cost of, for example, a harmony tree. And after this, uh, after this cost is covered, 
<laughs> they had to actually ask for the government or the insurance to pay and it can take a year or a year and a half, for example. Pharmaceutical products, we don't have any of the countries have B valeridine. And I think that will help a lot with our breeding program uh, problem at the MCS uh, breeding. And we also have lots of generics. We have a lack of technology. No, we don't have a lack of technology. We have a cost, um, a, a cost that is very increasing, and that makes it makes it difficult for us to have technology. And also, we need training. We need training here in Latam. So to finish this, of course, it is difficult and costly for Latam. It is very costly. And it, but it is feasible and possible. And of course, the most important, it, it saves lives. So thank you very much. This is all of my colleagues from LATAM that uh, actually sent me their data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Montes, for a compelling presentation. I would like to introduce our final speaker today, Dr. Scott Silvestri, Director of the Heart Transplant and Mechanical Circulatory Support Program at Advent Health System in Orlando, Florida who will be discussing the financial burden of bridging patients to heart transplantation on mechanical circulatory support. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to be here. One of the key questions that we were faced with is not only is, uh, is it effective, patient effective with the bridging strategies that have evolved, but is it cost effective? And certainly we're layering a lot of cost on this system. Uh, Uh, hold on one second, I apologize, there we go. And so the spoiler is, there's no real data yet, uh, but I have the questions and I think well, we have a framework where we could see the directionality in this and moving forward. These are my disclosures. You know, transplant is the balance of multiple unknowns. It's the unknown of what the donor is really like. It's the unknown of the recipient in the operation and what the outcomes will be technically. And it's the unknown moving forward with the rest of them. Uh, so. Uh, my, I'm, my idol is Michael Lewis, and he wrote a book called Moneyball, where people actually looked at the quantitative uh, analysis of baseball after a semi-autistic uh, uh, analyst out of Kansas City who made some observations and put the data down and showed him that many people in the business were doing things the wrong way. And so maybe the, we have something to learn here if we take away our biases. Uh, the direct comparison of data doesn't exist for pre and post in terms of direct cost. We have to be cognizant of that when we talk about the majority of transplants that are occurring, they're really occurring now in the top tiers in the United States, the high urgencies are HU in, in Europe, and that when we come down to our system currently, that really amounts to balloon pumps and other MCS as the speakers before me have mentioned. So what does that look like? Oh, I apologize. Um, well, it's interesting because pre and post change for the balloon pumps which in this cohort represented about 10 months at 676 patients represents approximately 56 patients per month in the time frame, And you can see that the listing days on the wait list for balloon pump patients was lower than it was pre-policy, even though there were about 17 patients per month in this, in this period. So we've evolved from a durable VAD approach to a balloon pump and or MCS approach for temporary basis. We know that when we talk about costs, and I was asked about cost, the perspective is very important. Two people can look at the same thing completely differently and describe it differently. And we know based on the talks we saw before that uh, technology such as uh, cold storage, uh, perfusion, and uh, other methods have gone up. We know that those of us who do this every day, the jet costs have skyrocketed because of the labor market as well as the cost of fuel and the scarcity of jets, the labor cost has gone up, the organ acquisition cost. And because of the length of stay for patients who are now being bridged in the hospital, the length of stay goes up. And then one has to factor in when you're talking to your administrators, you have to factor in the idea that they can't put other patients in those beds while you have a patient waiting for 50 days for a heart transplant. One of the advantages by assuming the payer perspective besides the availability of data, is that some of these later in costs are less important. The system perspective is important, but the individual hospital and center are probably less important, but they're important to the hospital. So we have inherent conflicts. 
And then lastly, in the United States, this funny thing called the Medicare cost report data, they're in essence unavailable to get the costs that aren't paid for on a per incident or per transplant basis that the government funds and subsidizes for transplant centers. And that data is simply not there to look at. And last time frame is important. If you transplant someone today, as opposed to bridging them for two years, you do potentially save the cost of the care. Well, what happens when we, um, cost of the care on the bat, what happens when we shifted the allocation in 2018 in October? We can see here very easily that a lot of balloon pumps were put in, durable VADs stopped going in, and that ECMO became a prime driver for these, these um, treatments. And that's important. And this stimulated a change and certainly incentivized the change. So it's important also to consider that selection of the initial bridge may be time dependent. A patient comes in with chronic heart failure and acute exacerbation, a balloon pump and medical management inotropes may be a very reasonable option up front. But after that blood type O patient, of which 67% are transplanted by four weeks, but 33% are not, may get transitioned to something else or they may stay on a balloon pump. So it may not be the same reasonable and you're doing it at a certain cost. And then lastly, the opportunity for lesser support ceases to be viable when the patient decompensates on a balloon pump as we've just escalated early this morning on a patient with a balloon pump to a patient with a, the patient with an Impella uh, 5.5. So that patient winds up. And so center variation is real and time marches on. So there could be patients and we're seeing that people are bridged with multiple, multiple uh, bridges and stacked. If we talk about the cost effectiveness terminology, the ICER or incremental cost effectiveness is calculated here as the incremental cost divided by the effectiveness of that intervention. And for some it's VAD versus transplant or medical therapy versus VAD. If we look at data from uh, Montefiore in the past, and we can see that this is good data, just graphically to show us that almost 60% of the uh, transplant cost is with the initial index hospitalization, whereas the remainder readmissions is less and the outpatient total is a significant amount. This contrasts with VADs, whereby the index admission is almost 76%. And using this data, the index alone, correcting for US dollars for the first, uh, the first amount is about, uh, $420,000 for a heart transplant now and LVAD 470. And then if you say, what does it cost to bridge a patient? Using these data adjusted for inflation today, it turns out to be about 670,000 for the first year. That contrasts with what it costs for a heart transplant patient for the first year. And, and the cost is significantly lower. And incidentally, for reference, my colleagues in South America the cost for a heart transplant is only 70,000, again, $2016, but $70,000, which is for them also significantly cheaper than the uh, amount that they're paid by insurance. This is a, uh, a payer combination, and you can see for the commercial population, it's important to notice the difference versus the VAD population that the inpatient index admission is almost a million dollars uh, for the first three months, the next nine months, and then subsequent time, it's significantly cheaper. But a uh, heart transplant for the Medicare is still very, very significant. It is nowhere near the 70,000 for Brazil. So we actually looked at this and we looked at bridging for patients for heart transplant and ECMO. Now this is not exactly the question that I was asked, but if we look at the data, we can see that transplant mean cost for ECMO bridge patients on patient level data from the national inpatient sample, you can see the mean is $636,000. The maximum was 917, the inpatient cost, et cetera. And you can compare that for these patients. And then the survival was gauged from previous data. Probably the survival is better, but looking at it directionally, if the cost is approximately all in for 1.9 million for the first year, that the quality adjusted life years of 12.6 for a transplant after ECMO, and that the intervention, the uh, incremental cost is 570 divided by that, it gives you uh, approximately $246,000, which is well above the threshold established by many, uh, many countries and insurers. Uh, this is 246 versus 50,000, which is what the UK uses. Uh, ECMO bridge to LVAD also is numbers which are off the scale, 
and don't even make sense. But the reality is that ECMO bridging, and it seems like a good idea, like a lot of things when you do it, but then you get in the middle of it and you say, maybe this isn't gonna work out the way I thought. This is actual data from our institution looking at the last three years for ECMO, bridge to transplant, the number of cases, the average length of stay, the case mix index, which is a driver of complexity, the charges per case in this, and the net revenue as well as direct costs and the contribution margin per case. And you can see we had a run of several uh, sick patients in 2021. And you can see looking at in aggregate, the numbers look something like um, 12 total cases with an average length of stay in the 40s. And sorry, and a contribution margin with direct costs of only $71,000 uh, per case when you look at these in aggregate across a real world sample with, uh, with a mix of payers. Now, ideally, we'd like to stay in 2021 where we uh, contribute 200,000 per case and not in uh, 2022 where we were negative 400,000 because there was a public payer and it was a very sick patient. Additionally, when one looks at these numbers, uh, one can see that you're very subject to the payer mix and you cannot simply pick which patients you're gonna bridge according to what payer, as well as seeing the complexity. Again, it seemed like a good idea, maybe like a ride through the rapids, but when you're in the middle of it, you really can be unsure of how that is gonna turn out. And then the last point to bring out is that one has to know what perspective you're talking about. If we're talking about entire countries such as Colombia, Brazil, United States, UK, um, Germany, the system perspective is different than the hospital perspective. And taking that on for this one patient, a US patient ECMO to open heart with a seven day hospital stay with discharge with a $4.5 million of charges with private insurance may pay $3.2 million. The contribution margin when you look at your direct costs might come out to 1.1 million, which is great. However, even with a Medicare outlier payment of $976 million, uh, $976, uh, $1,000 against it, the contribution margin, you wind up upside down uh, with a payment of nearly a million and a cost of almost 2 million, your contribution margin is negative 1 million. And that will not make you per very popular with your uh, hospital administration. And then if one looks at that one patient, uh, again, compared to your colleagues who say, why are you having keeping these patients in our ICU for so long? We can do so many things with that. The patient stayed in the hospital 70 days, 45 of which were ICU, 25 were PCU. You certainly can run 22 cabbage patients through with a contribution margin approaching $100,000. Now it's significantly less, but on the top side in the green, you're at 1.1 million positive. On the bottom side, you're at 1.1 million negative. And whereas with the cabbage patient, you're not likely to lose money. So I know there's not a lot of data. There's no analysis uh, or data to present yet. The devil's in the details. How many patients do you bridge with a bloom pump? How many bad actor ECMO patients do you wind up with? And then what do you do with the patients who wind up on ECMO but get delisted and never get transplanted? Certainly those will collect a certain amount, but you're not gonna analyze them in the same. And I think it's important to put them in the denominator so you know that if the goal is transplant as intention to treat and you don't get to transplant, you have to look at the utility. And that depends on what you do at your center and the behavior. And then how do we factor into these, these patients who fall off, additional costs to the system and the lack of the opportunity cost? This data will be coming, but I, I think our field needs to take a peek to see. And then the other things which we know, and to quote Senator Everett McKinley Dirksen, who said a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. In 2018, for the first time, expenditures for a heart transplant crossed the billion dollar mark. And in the 2022, they were up 40% to 1.4 billion. Organs are scarce, dollars are scarce as well, and we are fairly robust at taking into account how this looks for organs, but we in the United States at least, not the same for our colleagues in South America, are less sensitive to the fact that dollars are, are and will become even more scarce. And then lastly, currently, we do not take into account the cost for these life-saving therapies when we determine the allocation systems, but should we? Is the travel distance and the plane cost gonna factor in at some point as to who should have the organ? Can we afford 
to do 5,000 heart transplants if they all cost $1 million? That's a very important question that others will have to answer. And I will end you there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silvestri, for bringing light to a topic that's not frequently discussed, but we need to keep in mind as stewards of the health system as we strive to help patients with advanced heart failure. I would like to thank all guest speakers for their excellent presentations and for staying on time, providing the opportunity for discussion at the end. Um, going over the poll questions, it's great to see well how across the world, of course, strategies and, and, and a more liberal application of temporary mechanical circulatory support is, is being applied. Uh, we are getting a better sense of the importance of patient selection and, and the strategies to approach these patients and when to, to escalate support. Uh, being mindful of, of the details, as each of you point out, and, and eventually they need to better understand what it all means in, in, in terms of, of financial terms uh, for, the, for the health uh, system at, at large. So with this, um, I'd like um, to open up for, for comments from, from our speakers, uh, starting with, with Dr. Stelic. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the presentations. Uh, I am, I would just, uh, as we've seen the allocation systems across the world uh, differ quite a bit. Uh, I think uh, regardless of that, the technology evolution has seen increased use of MCS everywhere and the financial implications, of course, are, are quite high. Uh, and I would welcome uh, any comments from the other panelists, whether uh, they would recommend a change in the current allocation system we have in the United States. If they have had one pick, what would they do? Looks like Dr. Barron is, is thinking hard. David, if, if, I, if I told you I can grant you one wish for the allocation system, what would it be? Well, I think honestly, the one wish is that we have to shorten the length of time on some therapies. The patient who truly responds to a balloon who cannot really be well supported on something else is the exception that I presented. Many of these balloons are not necessarily ones that, that couldn't be substituted by something else. And meanwhile, I always focus on the fact that so many donors are not used. So perhaps shortening the length of time on some of the less extreme methods of support, or at least making people justify the donors they turn down. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And we often talk about the window of opportunity, right? And in, in, in some of these patients, the window of opportunity is short. It would be great to have a more predictable time to transplant in these patients. As we look into um, patients with biventricular uh, phenotype, uh, failure phenotype, um, the question came from the audience regarding the role of IBM and BTR that is being introduced. Uh, I would like to ask as a panelist if any of you have had experience and how do you see this uh, coming on board um, as an alternative to VA ECMO doing uh, biventricular uh, support. Hi there from Brazil. My name is Samuel uh, Stefan here from Sao Paulo uh, from the Heart Institute. I'm really glad to be here. Great talks. Very nice to be here with you. And we do uh, a lot of transplants here in Sao Paulo. We did last year 62. And we are a bit used to uh, uh, balloon pump. Um, about 60% of our patients are bridged using a balloon pump. Uh, we did our uh, modification, our uh, allocation system uh, in 2021. So um, the, the thing that changed our practice here uh, last year and, the day in, and also in 2021 was that our patients bridge on ECMO, uh, it's status one now. So we did more uh, heart transplants using ECMO. Uh, at the first time, uh, 2021, uh, we were happy with our results. Our patients went well. Uh, but then last year, uh, we did more patients and more, and our results were not very good on those patients on ECMO. So uh, this year, we are, you know, <laughs> trying to, to keep less patients uh, bridge on ECMO. Uh, 
and it's something that we need to look at and we don't know which ones can uh, go better. Uh, uh, the, the thing that you just said uh, about the window opportunity is something that is very special on those patients bridge on ECMO. But thank you once again, uh, great talks, great discussion. Nice to be here. Thank Actually, you, I was, uh, I was yesterday talking to Fabio Gaiotto about exactly what he just exposed. Um, uh, Stefan, so yes, we worked together. We had 62 yes. patients from uh, the INCOR uh, were transplanted and they put nine patients in ECMO with uh, very bad results in these patients. So um, it was probably with speaking with Fabio, he said they they stopped putting patients in, in ECMO as bridge to transplant or more yes. uh, transplanting patients that were coming with ECMO. And it was probably because these patients were uh, excessively ill. Uh, and that's why the bad results were like that. Uh, but it's something he said, um, you are using a lot more balloon counterpulsation and you have more good results with that right now. Yes, that's, we, were, we were together answering your questions yesterday. I was with him in discussing that point. And uh, yes, we have good results using balloon pump. About 60% of our patients go to high transplants using balloon pump. In ECMO, this year we stopped for now, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna uh, do it again uh, along the year. Uh, you know, one gonna, concept that yeah. is important, and as we all learn and we all, uh, you know, consolidate our shock teams, is that the, the adequate uh, indication, as it was pointed out of, of the, the proper mechanical and selection of proper mechanical devices and then in the context of the, of, the, of the patient. So as we try to bail out with the one bullet approach, as Dr. Barron described, uh, more so in patients with stage D or E uh, sky shock uh, patients with, with VA ECMO, uh, then it's about stabilizing them and transition of support or whether transition of cannulation strategy. And, and I was glad to see from the poll questions that over a third of the participants have adopted, uh, you know, cannulation in the upper extremities, which is a platform that once a patient is stabilized, certainly facilitates the prehabilitating and, and reconditioning the patient in general in anticipation for a heart transplant. One question that came, and I would like to share here with the, with the participants, with the panel, uh, is uh, the considerations for accepting rather marginal donors uh, for patients on short-term devices and which would be your considerations and how you would weigh in the decision? Maybe I will quickly start it and then we can have uh, Dr. Barnhart who asked the question tell us his perspective. I think at least in the United States, this does not seem uh, to be the case uh, taking two sick or two donors that are not perfect for ECMO candidates. In fact, Dr. Hanf, I think has recently published data that would indicate that because ECMO candidates are type one, centers actually tend to wait for the perfect donor for these candidates rather than uh, rather than taking a high risk donor. So at least that has not panned out. So it's probably more the, the, the selection of the candidate rather than just, uh, just high risk donor. How about in Germany, Alex? Yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, I mean, we are in a country with long waiting times. So, um, um, transplanting from a short-term device is is a rare occasion, at least. So we have the we have to balance the risk of you know waiting on a short-term device on one hand side, and accepting um, and waiting for the perfect organ on the other hand side. So the tendency is, I would say, to to accept this not perfect organ because all these short-term device patients are not, um, uh, have not priority um, uh, in contrast to all these other high urgency patients. So that's why I'm asking, yeah. And then uh, piggybacking on this question, uh, would I appreciate the considerations from the panel for patients that are on lower profile support devices, whether a balloon pump or, or, or an impella, uh, the consideration for to use uh, DCD donors or, or patients that had that come from a longer distance and maybe on 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 a perfusion device. So unfortunately, we at uh, LATAM we don't have a DCD yet 
but Chile, Argentina, and Colombia are working um, fast and hard on it. And um, the precision just, um, we had one patient that, uh, the, um, well, a patient that has an accident and she was brain dead. We don't have this D, so she had to be brain dead, but um, she was pretty stable and we needed to, to recover this organ. So we kind of laid her on ECMO, bring her to our center. And after that study, uh, lactate and uh, echo and a lot of things. And after that, uh, all organs were recovered and we could transplant uh, heart, uh, kidneys and, um, and liver. Uh, and we tried to do the, so it was super successful and the first time in the country. So that's great. It's, it's uh, new for us. We tried to do the same thing with another patient, uh, also brain dead. Um, but uh, this patient was supposed to have a normal heart because he was uh, young. Well, he was like 50. So, but something wasn't pretty right. So we did a... Um, catheterization and we were going to do catheterization but in the echo he was uh, 35 percent of lbef and um uh, it wasn't uh, he had um heart um heart disease so we couldn't use it but it's something that we are trying now to have more donors any final thank you dr montes any final comment dr mayedifar yeah I, I also wanted to comment on that because i think Thinking about marginal organs just for short-term device patients, I mean, in Austria, we're very lucky. We have very short waiting times in Austria. We had the, we actually did the, an analyzation of all, uh, analyzed all our patients on ECMO, and I think the waiting time, the median waiting time was 11 days, actually, um, for the patients when they had were on short-time MCS device like ECMO. Um, but it's in general safe to say that it's important to to expand the donor pool. We use we do DCD transplantations, of course, also in Austria, and, and not only on short term device patients. We do it in in, in general and on all our, our our recipients. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Any final comments as we get to the end of the uh, webinar? Thank you. I think you know one of the things that would be very fascinating if someday. Uh, they get to the situation where they just trust the physicians taking care of the patients and just rotate the organs. Okay, there's X number of donors and take it for who you think will do best. In some sense, I think the current U.S. system where the physician chooses to put in maybe a balloon pump and then the patient is able to get transplanted is in a way the physician driving, all right, this patient is stable. They need to go. They need to be transplanted. Someday maybe we'll be smart enough to just say, all right, rotate organs with the exception of maybe super high urgency and trust that we really have the patient's best interest at heart and for good outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Barron. So I would like to thank all the speakers and the audience uh, for staying us with us to, to, to till the end of the webinar. And um, I would like to point out that the webinar will be posted on YouTube. All participants who attended the webinar will receive a survey by email and we appreciate your response as we try to improve with each webinar. On behalf of the cardiothoracic surgery professional community, I'd like to thank ISHLT for supporting this activity, our ex expert panel on, uh, of presenters, and the audience um, who have a, a true interest and dedication to treat patients with advanced uh, heart failure. Have a good day.